All right, so we uh, did finish another uh, installation here uh, in Edgewater at Viking Aircraft, and a uh, gentleman that owns the plane, we'll introduce him, and you, sir, are? Jeff Roberts. Jeff Roberts, and uh, why are you building a Zenit? Observation. Okay. I wanted an observation craft. Uh, I built a fiberglass Europa in the past, flew it for 10 years, very fast plane, so speed wasn't my objective. Okay. But just to enjoy the flight is my objective. Okay. <clears throat> and you do have the best of all of the Zenits in the fact that you have a cruiser design. And you're actually, uh, I, I, could, I mean, I can even see it from here, uh, making some fairings and making the airplane the way you want it to be. Well, there's anything that an old friend of mine used to say from Wright Aviation in Tennessee. Steve Wright passed away now, but a great guy. Uh, built a lot of fiberglass airplanes and he used to say all the time if it looks fast it probably is faster that's so, it the idea with anything that we do with this airplane is going to be make it as clean as you can make this airplane right right so we have tail fairings uh the entire tail which you can't see here has a wrap around fairing to and the tail instead of coming straight down to the body slopes forward like the newer Cessnas. so we'll be able to see all these things and you've already offered that when the airplane's finished you might consider flying it to Sun and Fun and let people see uh, what it turned out to be. Been there many times with the other one, and it uh, it won some prizes, and this one we hope will do the same. And yes, we will be taking it into Sun and Fun. And you live at a at a flying community, I think. Leeward Air Ranch. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so a lot of other pilots and maybe builders will be able to see this plane, and uh, I'm sure they have their opinions and <laughs> want to help and point out things that you didn't do right and. They are, we, we have every every opinion you want times 10, and that's a good thing because it's amazing the people that live in there and how friendly and helpful. Uh, they're always stopping by the hangar. You can stop any nice day. Our hangar's up. We have usually three or four golf carts sitting there. Everybody float. The opinion's flowing, the comments flowing, and we enjoy it. And that shows you how lucky we are in Florida to have this kind of uh, aviation because uh, my friend Vern, uh, you know, Vern just turned 89 and he's yeah. down here for the winter. And he said that there's only two airplanes parked on his ramp in Rhode Island left. And there used to be a lot more. And so aviation is shrinking, but here in Florida, we had, we're lucky enough to see it oh, flourish. Absolutely. We have about you know, over 150, 160 homes at Leeward. Everyone with a hangar, you can't own there unless you're a pilot right and on an airplane and it's a wonderful thing because everybody's into the same hobby just like people that live around a golf course it's sure a wonderful thing. all right well it's very nice uh for a viking to be able to do the installation we also did a video on the installation so we'll combine that with this um and um uh, yeah thanks for the business and uh we hope to see you again sounds good fast forward a couple of years and it'll be pretty <laughs> <laughs> all right it's going on christmas here in florida this is Jeff Roberts' airplane. We're doing an install. Actually, it's all complete. So I figure we document it just uh, for everyone else, but also for him to be able to get every wire and everything labeled, uh, put on a schematic. Got a little bit of noise around here today. Some airplanes, some grinding. But it's not really windy, so we should be able to do something. Let's just start from the front door. Let's do an overview. We got a 130 engine in a Zenith Cruiser airframe. The airframe uh, has been done very nicely so far. Uh, he's actually playing around with some really nice fairings. He's excellent with fiberglass, so he's got some nice fairings made up here. He's making one for the top there, which he doesn't have here now. Uh, don't see the dual sticks very often, but uh, has the dual sticks. It's got the uh, double uh, stringers in the fuselage that cross, uh, tones down the oil canning just slightly. And then, uh, so that's kind of the overview. We already reviewed the instrument panel that slides out. So maybe as we get a little bit further, we'll slide that out and we can talk about uh, every wire that was, that was done. So this installation is gonna be, video is gonna be quite detailed because it's mostly for him to be able to document where every wire goes and a reference to this particular airplane. But of course it can also be used for other people installing a 130 in their cruiser or a Zenit. Now we're topping off the batteries with the charger while we're doing this. Of 
right there down a little bit from having worked on the airplane so we'll get that all charged up but let's start and do this in segments so we're going to start talking from the front towards the back of the airplane uh, let's get into the propeller first okay so on the cruiser it's quite common to use a 69 inch whirlwind propeller it has a decent ground clearance once the wings and tail and everything is on and the airplane's kind of sitting more on the main gear than on the nose wheel. Initially, uh, in an install like this without the wings and the tail, there's a lot of weight on the nose wheel because there's no weight in the airframe and all the weight is on the firewall. But uh, yeah, so that's a nice propeller for it. Uh, we've set this one just preliminary at 20 degrees, which will be just for the initial starting and run-ups and everything. And then we might want to fine tune that as we move along. The uh, propeller is installed according to Whirlwind's instructions. Uh, some things that I'd like to point out is, this is a, a ground adjustable hub, which means there's, you, you will loosen and retighten bolts a lot, you know, until you get the pitch set perfectly. Each of these bolts uh, go right through the propeller extension and into the lug behind it. Okay, and you want about two threads or so, or a little bit more, as long as it doesn't touch the gearbox, showing on the back side, so that you know that the bolt is the right length for the installation. Always put a, a drop of anti-seize or, or gear oil or something on the threads when you install the bolts each time you take it out. Not too much, because it'll, it'll fling onto the propeller, but just a tiny little coating on the threads. Uh, again, because of what I said, it, they, you're gonna be using these bolts, not as a one-time installation, but it gets tightened over and over again and loosened over again to set the pitch of the propeller. So that covers the installation. I usually do 200 inch pounds here and 150 on these guys, but uh, more so these are the important ones for, for 190 to 200 inch pounds. Here, uh, my, my personal uh, uh, way of doing it is I gradually tighten them down until I see a fairly uniform gap everywhere because that's ultimately what you're looking for. Next thing is the gearbox of the engine. This is the latest generation gearbox. <clears throat> Up here we have the probe to measure the temperature. This is the probe for the Viking view. And we strain relieve all that as it leaves the center unit and we bundle it all so that anywhere where there's a connection, it is secure and it can't pull apart. The gearbox needs to have gear oil put into it. This is a 14 millimeter hex, and you remove that and slowly pour the gearbox oil in. You would fill it with the Mobile One 75W140 uh, gear oil until the sight glass is full and then another wait for that to slowly fill and then another three ounces there's a drain plug on the bottom for draining it we are running a venting system on the back of the gearbox right there we had a poppet valve for a short time and that works but now when we're running eight ounces of lube there is a slight chance that a few dribbles of gear oil will come out so we are we have installed a gearbox venting canister on the firewall next to the coolant canister. This is vented. You'll never actually use this one. This is not where you fill gear oil. This is not where you measure gear oil. This is only to vent possible fumes of gear oil coming out of the gearbox because you don't want gear oil on your engine and it smells. This is vented through this little rubber washer in here and down through the threads of the bottle. So that's, you see there's no really visible vent and it's because it goes up through here and then down through these coarse threads and that's the venting. And it's the same with the coolant bottle. So you don't want to tighten this too much, just down and just a tiny bit of a, of a snug like that. So that covers the venting of the gearbox and filling of the gearbox. And in the beginning, you're gonna drain it often and then uh, over time you'll build confidence in your gearbox and you'll be able to see less and less dirt in the gear oil and it'll be running nice and clean and your temperatures will stabilize. Working our way back from the 
front of this airplane just to have a system. And see now right behind the gearbox, we have a couple of items. Here's uh, fittings that are provided in the heater kit that screws in here. And it's for the feed of the heater. Uh, anything coming from the cylinder head is the hot coolant. And then that would be going to one side of the heater, which in this airplane is installed inside here. And it has a little brace on it and goes through the firewall. So one of the heater hoses goes here and then the other one goes over there. We also have up front here, the four pound pressure cap where you would initially fill the cooling system. You basically screw a plastic funnel down into it, uh, put a rag around here so that when air burps out of it, it doesn't splash onto your engine and then slowly fill it over time. Uh, and cooling will find its way all the way through the hoses. Eventually, you won't be using this. This is, it will just stay closed and you will be filling coolant in the reservoir over there. And then uh, for the initial runs, uh, the coolant will disappear. Uh, you actually wanna make sure you have enough in there that it doesn't. But, but coolant, air gets pushed out and coolant gets sucked in each time you warm up and shut down the engine and let it sit. So as you warm up the engine, cool air gets pushed out with coolant and it goes into the bottle and it looks like there's a lot of coolant. Then you let it sit and it'll suck it all, the, the vacuum will draw it into the engine and that's when you wanna make sure you have enough coolant in there that it doesn't then draw the air back in. So that's how that works and then you can purge the engine that way. <clears throat> and then eventually your coolant level is gonna to be towards the bottom of the coolant bottle. Uh, you just wanna make sure you have a little bit there and then in flight, it'll be about halfway up. <clears throat> so that's the whole deal about the pressure cap. Of course, the pressure cap and the four pound is there to have very low pressure on hoses uh, in case there ever was a leak. And in order then to be able to run the NPG waterless coolant, which is the only thing that we use with the Viking engine. So you never want to add any water to this system. Looking around up front here, we also would see <clears throat> another measurement of a temperature, which is the coolant probe right down in there. If you don't have your Viking View instrument installed from here, or you're using a different engine monitor, we've covered this before, but it's kind of difficult to get to the location of this probe for coolant because it's right down there behind the gearbox. <clears throat> so the easiest way to do that, and what we did here, was to just take these two screws out on this block and just pop it off, clean the surface, use the right stuff Permatex sealer and then put it back on after you install the, the probe into the block. Right behind that is part of the engine. That's the high pressure pump for the um, direct injection system on this uh, 2019 Honda engine. And as far as that, this high pressure side, you'll never open up. This is 2200 PSI and it goes to a fuel rail underneath here that shoots fuel into the cylinders. The rest of it you're gonna be working on and during the installation, which is what this video is, um, you're going to have a um, fuel pressure hose going to the high pressure pump. And that comes from your header tank, which has pumps that bring the fuel up to 43 PSI or three bar. And that hose terminates here and it originates from the back of the airplane, uh, the header tank and the high pressure fuel filter area, which we'll get to as we work our way back. As you're working on your cooling system installation, the latest here is uh, when you use a belly mounted radiator, which this has, <clears throat> is you're gonna be coming off of the cylinder head. Again, remember this was the hot section uh, the, of the coolant. Um, and you're going to use a special Oetiker clamp there, uh, 40 millimeter, which is a screw clamp, so you can remove this if you ever had to. And then the initial hose is a 45 <clears throat> with a little joiner, and then we're going to turn 90 and we come straight back. And now the clamps are all either a 38.1 or a 40 millimeter uh, crimp clamp, depending on what fits better in that application. 
and then you're gonna make a 90 degree turn and you're gonna to go to the other side of the engine in order to enter the radiator. You're also gonna do a screw clamp at the beginning here at the engine and then you have the 135 hose, a little joiner, and then you're gonna go down into the engine and this becomes a 45 millimeter um, screw clamp going on to the radiator. So, and it's the same on the other side. <clears throat> That's pretty much it for, you know, routing the coolant lines from the engine to the radiator. Now with the starter motor, you have a few fitting uh, connectors. This one's already done for you and there's a wire inside the airplane at the other end of the computer loom that says starter. And it'll go to this starter solenoid. Back in here, however, you have to hook up some number six wires. We use welding cable for that only because it's nice and flexible, which is good on an engine where things vibrate. And we run then one over to the uh, alternator. As you can see, we strain relieved it right before we go to the alternator terminal because the alternator will vibrate a little bit more than the engine. It's mounted quite a bit off the engine. <clears throat> so you do want to make sure you strain relieve that so this terminal never breaks. So you're gonna run one, ho one uh, cable to that the other one you're gonna run, in this case, we ran it actually up, uphill, <clears throat> and then we, uh, we brought it across the engine here. And we have now a ground through terminal and a positive through terminal that we mounted going through the firewall. And we'll get back to that. So that's the starter. All right, still staying up front here, but moving in from the other side. This is the connector that goes to the computer that controls the high pressure pump. <clears throat> These are your ignition coils. And this kind of stuff, you know, it's very easy. All these are very similar where you push something and then you can disconnect it. That's just how these things work. You hear for, look, sound for a click when you push it back on. You're gonna use the Zero 020 oil in this. We actually have people using like aviation oil and things like that and uh, no no you're going to use zero 20 oil synthetic and the reason for that is the variable valve timing solenoids things that control the valves and things on this engine are tight enough um, that that's what they need in order to be able to be operating properly uh, working our way down here we have the exhaust system now the exhaust system comes separate with the engine but it's super easy to install. You've got a, a bolt here. Of course, you put all your hardware on loosely and then you just snug it down after that. There's a all metal gasket here. It's like a sandwiched uh, stainless steel gasket. And it, that's basically the entire exhaust system right there. So you'd be pleasantly surprised if you've been working on light combings and connells and rogue taxes where there's pipes all over the engine. This sender down here, just for your information, is the Crankshaft, crankshaft position sensor and it goes into the middle of the engine here <clears throat> here is your uh, VIN number of your car so you can uh, you know people always ask us where we get engines and how can we get them with that low mileage and all that well if somebody wants to let me turn the camera maybe it'll you can uh, you can take this VIN number let me move this thing around there's a 5 at the end there so, or a 3 in the beginning they move that all the way down and you can do a car search with that, Carfax. And just, this is just a random engine that we have and you can find out where it came from, what kind of damage, how many miles, all that kind of stuff. I think this one had six miles. All right, then we work our way back to the engine mounting attachment. <coughs> use, you're gonna use uh, uh, AN6 uh, bolts everywhere. Now, because of the way the engine's mounted like this with, with these welded in uh, tubes, which are very strong, it's all 4130 steel. The top is super easy to do. You just kind of bolt that in. The bottom, however, um, getting the MS nuts, which is a smaller nut with the same strength as an AN nut, but a much smaller head. And then underneath that nut, change to a structural countersunk screw instead of these AN3 bolts which are get in the way of that attach point will make it your life much easier 
and when you use the MS nuts, put a drop of oil on there so you don't mess up the threads with that all, all metal locking nut. Now, when you get up here, as you can see, we ended up with the screws in a, in a kind of a strange position, but no big deal. They can be further up. But this airplane already had, somebody was trying to get an aero momentum engine, which things didn't pan out. So they had already drilled holes all over the firewall that were not in line with the pilot holes from Zenit. And, but the nice thing was when we changed it, we were able to reuse uh, the original um, wrong holes, but without adding additional holes to the firewall, we're able to get two AN4s in there nicely. <clears throat> so that worked out good. Now up front here, all of these engine mounts, first of all, these are um, these are uh, bushings that are from, for home builders uh, and they're silicone, okay? So silicone is a little bit softer and it, it works nice and everything, but it seems to have a tendency to make small little hairline cracks here. Um, and that's not a big deal. And of course you want to monitor that, but that's just how these things are. They just have that tendency. This particular corner mount here is the tightest one on the engine. And of course you don't want uh, anything metal to touch the engine because that defeats the purpose of the mount. So this one, you do have to take your big washer and just round it off a little bit. This is probably a little more than it was needed, but, um, but yeah, that's the idea. It's just to not have the washer hit the engine. The other ones have plenty of clearance. This is the radiator installation. Now, for those of you that already have a Zenit airplane with the Viking engine, you'll notice that the radiator from this point out continues on, okay? It's a bigger radiator. It has a lot more surface area than traditionally. That's not because we needed it even here in Florida, but somehow uh, some builders have just been requesting that if we can have more cooling, give us more cooling. And this is the, the solution for that. It's the same type of radiator, it's the same fittings to hook it up. It is just wider. And being on the belly of the airplane, the width of the radiator makes no difference as far as aesthetics. Now we also have, you'll see this in our next installation, a new shroud coming. This is just a handmade shroud that we made uh, to install the engine or the radiator. But the new shroud, because the radiator is so much wider, will be an inch uh, lower here, so it'll look nicer with the cowling. And it'll be all CNC bent, so it will have uh, nice features to it that you'll see when, we, when it arrives. As you can see, this airplane has the Viking steel bungee, which is a nice setup, and it's, uh, it's, it's flexible. You can adjust it, of course. This one, you just need a little bit of oil on it, but it was just installed. But it gives a lot more suspension than both the rubber pucks and the rubber cord that's standard with these airplanes. It's more of a, of a you know, real suspension spring. Now, down here uh, is something I want to point out. There is enough ground clearance for a cruiser to go off pavement and all that, but here's something where a little spacer block wouldn't hurt on some airplanes if you're gonna use a cruiser on the grass or it's more of a universal airplane. Some people have also put <clears throat> bigger wheels on their cruiser and a bigger fork up front from uh, a different airplane, different stall airplane uh, like the Super Duty or, uh, or even the regular stall. Uh, Zenith to mimic the, um, uh, you know, the prop height that those airplanes would have. Throttle cable is very simple. Um, we uh, use a single throttle on this one. That's what the customer wanted. We've got a single throttle. And it just runs through the firewall and the grommet and right to a sub panel down here. Probably ask the builder if he this has not really been installed permanently. And because it's a slide out panel here, it would make sense to redo this bracket with bending it or um, making it down a little bit so the throttle goes straight out because now you have to lift the panel to move it out. Minor detail there. 
let's just look at this piece while we're here. This is now something that's available from Viking. You can buy this little aluminum piece that's uh, just water jetted. And if you're gonna use a Viking view with uh, the wired diagram that we have and all the same switches and stuff, then it's already set up for it. And so here you got battery one, battery two, alternator, fuel pump one, fuel pump two, and your instrument. And then you got the breakers for the pumps and uh, the instrument and uh, the alternator and then a 25 amp breaker for the starter uh, solenoid. As far as the grounding and the positive, we talked a little bit about these pass-throughs. These are, these are nice, um, Viking carries these. And basically you build, drill a pretty big hole in the firewall because you want the, the large part of it to go through. And then you want to use as low profile screws as you can so that none of the cables can, can short against the, the screws. The um, ground part, as you can see, we have, we're using the ground grounding strap now, which is softer. And one goes to each one of these screws out here on the engine. Grounding strap one and grounding strap two. And because that kind of stuff, the, the grounding straps and the throttle cable chafe real easy, we put the, the loom across them just to protect it. Now inside here is the finished wiring. Needs a little bit more bundling maybe. Uh, there's gonna be other things added other than the engine uh, by the builder. But basically, uh, we have mounted the ECU up here. We did not want the ECU to slide back and forth with this tray because we don't want these wires to keep moving each time that's done. So we have like a couple of bundles of wire here that move, that move together when you move the panel and that's it. The rest of them are stationary. The this is just exactly like it shows on the wire diagram, two batteries. Uh, both batteries of this size has to be has to be on for starting because they use number 10 wires, okay, to the solenoids. And then together they bring two number 10 wires to the main terminal strip. And from there is where you then go out to the engine. So basically you got it like a number seven, two number 10s make a number seven wire cable. Uh, so if you use both of them, you can start the engine. The reason we do that is we want, the philosophy is to use two smaller batteries to make up one battery, uh, not to have two batteries for, or one battery for starting because there's no requirement for that. The only requirement is to have a dual battery system where you can separate it during flight, okay? It's not a, a requirement to have one battery being able to start the engine. Now, let's talk a little bit about the details of where each wire goes and that will help the builder make a diagram or label wires and so forth. All right, here's the starter um, relay. It's shown on the wire diagram. The yellow wire here has a corresponding, if you take this, separate these two, you can write the number of the solenoid, which is written on it, or the relay, and correspond it to the color of the wire. This doesn't necessarily always have to be the same color as I have here, but if you bought your sol relay from us, then likely it is. But uh, here, this yellow one goes over. We installed a terminal strip here to make everything easier. And the yellow one then goes out to the uh, starter. So that's the other end of the wire that we saw out there at the starter. Through the terminal strip, and then it goes to the yellow wire. And that's the power out to the starter when you engage the ignition key. The black wire is the ground for the solenoid. The white wire goes to the S terminal of the starter switch, which is the start position when you turn the key. And then there's a blue wire down here and it goes, that's the power going into the solenoid. So when it's closed, it can then go out through the yellow wire and to the starter. And one last thing is on the ignition switch here, we also tee off 
another wire from the breaker to the ignition switch up to the B or battery terminal of the ignition switch. And then of course you have to feed the 25 amp breaker which powers everything from the positive bus of the airplane right here. All right, like the main basic uh, wiring, the, the big wires. You got two number 10s running to the uh, ground terminal there through the firewall and we got a number six welding cable running to the positive out to the engine. The two grounds, one goes to each side of the battery. Those are number 10s. Then the battery has a jumper between the two grounds to connect them. And then a uh, last wire from one side goes to the grounding strip in the airplane in order to provide grounds for all the airplane related and engine related stuff in the, um, in the airplane. So two went out to the engine compartment and one goes to the terminal strip and there's a jumper between the two grounds as well. On the positive side, there's a positive to the inside of this contactor, which is marked with a big plus down here. There's another positive going to the inside of the other contactor. The output of the contactors are joined together. And then from one of them, we go out to the engine to start the engine through the terminal right there. And then from each side, each output as well, uh, this one and this one, we power up the positive bus in the airplane. We got our heater wiring, which is basically right here. We haven't installed these. Don't know where the builder wants these installed. Um, but yeah, switch up, one fan, switch off, nothing, switch down, two fans. Okay, the wire diagram shows you how to wire that. There's just basically jumpers on the back here to make that happen. So the two red wires coming in are from the heater and then there's power going in. This is shown on the diagram and there's the fuse or the breaker for the heater. So pretty simple to do. Uh, while we're looking at some of these things, make sure that, you know, throughout an installation like that, everything is from aircraft spruce, okay? You don't want to be going out of auto parts store and buying uh, terminals that are inferior. They, these are, they look the same, but they have metal throughout the hole. They crimp on very nicely. Uh, you don't need just one size of these red ones. You need like these three or four different sizes uh, with different hole sizes to do an installation like this. And uh, same with everything, you know, it, it has to be the right thing for the, these, they look like just regular slip-on or fast-on terminals. But again, they're aviation grade. They, they fit better. They have a much better crimp. Also use the proper tools, you know, a ratcheting type of crimping tool and all that. You don't want to skimp on any of this because um, it has to be reliable. All right, so that's the batter. That's the, the heater, basically. Let's work our way down the switches here and see what each one is. This first breaker is uh, the Viking view or instrumentation. All right, so that gets labeled that in the wire diagram. Basically, we've got power through all of the breakers through this copper bar down here. So they all get power. And then from the top side of the breaker, we can then go to the things that we want to power. Like here's a jumper wire just from here to here. And it puts a protected one amp protection through the breaker to the switch. And then in the output side of the switch, we can now go to whatever it is that we want to power. In this case, we're going over and we're powering up our Viking View control box. And then the second switch is for the fuel pump two and it's the same in fuel pump one, and then the alternator field. So the same principle, the breakers get power at the bottom, and uh, the output side of the breaker has a jumper to the input side of the switch, and the same on all of them, and the output of the switch 
then goes to the respective load, such as a fuel pump. Uh, and then the other end, of, of course, of a fuel pump is it needs to be a ground. So that ground is then fed all the way back either to a terminal strip in the back of the airplane that's reliably wired up front here or all the way back to the uh, terminal strip here. Like we have fuel pump grounds brought all the way back here. Fuel pump ground one, fuel pump ground two. That was the ground for the uh, solenoid, the relay. And then we have yet another ground here for something. Basic uh, <clears throat> Viking view installation is the control box, mount the control box somewhere. Uh, carefully uh, push in your uh, connectors here and strain relieve them so that they don't bend uh, against that. And then route all of those. Uh, of course, they're pre-made cables, so sometimes you have to coil up a little bit of cable. But that's that's a, a small price to pay for having it all uh, pre-done. And then route your sensor wires out. You've got your oil pressure one here. As you can see, we, we strain relieve again wires with a tie wrap as soon as it leaves the sensor. Don't tighten the pressure sensors very hard. Use Teflon uh, uh, dope on the threads and then just snug them. If you ever have a leak, you can always tighten it a tiny bit more. But these are fragile uh, sender units. And in fact, if you tighten them really hard, you could break something uh, where the threads meet the body of it. So they could just be snug and then go back later. So you've got your oil pressure there. And we looked at the gearbox temperature and we've looked at the uh, <clears throat> coolant temperature up front already. In addition to that, there is uh, one of these running back uh, to the uh, fuel uh, area. We've just kind of laid the wires in here. This one is the only one that has to be spliced. You need two cables and you splice it because it has to make a long run all the way to the back of the airplane for the fuel pressure transducer, which is back in here. <clears throat> Now the Viking View itself has, uh, like we said, a one amp breaker. You can turn it on like that. And there it is. So once it fires up, you'll be able to read all that. You'll then have fuel pressure and oil pressure as well. From the control box of the Viking View, there is a uh, serial wire that just runs and powers up and sends the information to the display and that's strain, been strain relieved too. So there's just one cable from there to the control box and then the control box has all the cables coming in from the various sensors. Now there's a few more inputs and those are uh, they don't actually have sensors they would then go to uh, things like the tachometer like for instance here, there is a tack wire right there in purple. And now the tack wire is a little unique in that here's the tack wire coming in from the Viking view. As you can see, it's a cable, pre-made cable. So the blue one is the tack in, uh, input to the instrument. Now here's the tack output coming in from the ECU of the engine right here, okay? and it goes directly to the one that goes to the Viking View. So they just tee together, but we do it through a terminal strip like this to keep it clean. Now, when you look at your installation, you'll see that there's such a thing as a pull-up resistor. And what that is, is just, if you look back here, you see on this second terminal here, we have 12 volts coming in here from the avionics bus and then we just have a 1K resistor jumping over, putting 12 volts through the resistor onto the signal wire going through here. And that's the tack input for the Viking View. And it's also shown on the diagram of the Viking View. Then you need a, a ground for the Viking View, and it is done uh, cleanly through a special wire coming off, again, off the ECU of the engine, and it needs to go to the ground or of the Viking view, which will be this black wire right here. So that needs to go, that's the ground for the Viking view. It's very critical that it doesn't get grounded to the airframe. It needs to go to the cable from the uh, wire harness that comes with the engine that says Viking view only. 
It doesn't even say ground because we don't want anyone to get confused about grounding anything here. It's the wire that comes from the, that says Viking view only, goes to the black wire of the Viking view, which is the ground to it. And then the red and the white gets T together and they just get powered uh, to the avionics bus. And we just jumped it over to the one next here that we already said was the avionics bus right here. So that takes care of the ground and the power and the tack for the Viking view. All right, we just started it up just to run it and charge the cooling system. And then the fuel system is the same as the last video. We're going down here. There's a 90 degree fitting and some ADAL clamps. We're gonna go through the channel, which will be eventually be covered. And then back here, up through the floor. And we'll have a tight turn right here. We'll keep it close to the console once that's put in. And then through the bulkhead get our high pressure filter and then we got some of the wires kind of bundled up here they have to be obviously routed underneath the airplane so that's gonna be something the builder has to do when the um, channel is put in place so these are just temporarily put together to run the airplane and there's our splitter block again with the top as the orifice for a bleed Back to the tank after shutdown, and then we got two check valves coming from the pumps and a fuel pressure transducer, and then out to the high pressure and then to the engine. And the uh, tank is mounted traditionally with the square tubing right there, all the way up to the top using the AN5 rivets, and then uh, clamps running through the grooves of the tank. Let's see if we can get up. Picture of that. Yeah, basically right, like right there. And we got two hoses coming out here, and two hoses coming through over there in grommets. And then all four of them collect, and they go onto the top of the tank. And there was no provision on the install to put a drain in here, but of course you can put a drain in the header tank right here and with just a little extension nipple down through the floor here and then there's a brace from the header tank to the structure just to keep it from rotating and that's the whole installation All right, so it's uh, always like a little bit of a challenge to fit any kind of a cowling. So this one's been fitted now. Um, again, fits nice, but takes a little bit of trimming and fitting and getting it just right. Start working around the spinner, make a wooden piece there, 13 inch uh, piece, and then get the proper spacing up front and then keep relocating in the back until everything kind of floats and is, is where you need it. <clears throat> Sometimes you actually have to the cowling will, will pull up on you and you want to rise it, but uh, fight that temptation a little bit because you need it to be low enough too to clear the bottom of the engine. One thing, a little trick we found on this one, which helped us was, like I showed you last time, dividing the hinges into one, one long piece on the airplane and then the little three loop sections. In addition to that, on this one, we, we added a little AN3 washer between each uh, piece and the cowling and that seemed to make it easier to get 
the pin to go up and down. And then of course we always use the undersized pins. Um, found a new source for, source for those pins now, so they're not as expensive as they used to be. Now let's fit the top cowling and see what it looks like.